to Shamrock Evangelical Methodist Church this morning. And happy Easter. Glad you could join us today. This isn't exactly the way we had anticipated spending Easter Sunday, uh, but nonetheless, we're here and uh, we've joined together to worship the Lord. Our Lord lives. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. What a joy it is to serve a resurrected Savior today. And we join in together as we worship the Lord on this Resurrection Sunday. Join in with us today. We're glad that you have come along. Before we get started in reading God's Word and in the message this morning, I want to direct our attention in a word of prayer and ask God for His help and for His blessings today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have to call on you to come boldly to the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us through another week. You have been here with us, though this week has been different than any week we've had before, and we're not sure what tomorrow is going to bring, what the rest of the week is going to have. But Father, our trust and our confidence is in you today, and we're glad that you uh, love us with an everlasting love and that you know exactly where we are. This situation is uh, may have caught us by surprise, but it's not caught you by surprise. You knew from the beginning of time what we would be going through right now. And we worship you and we praise you today for your faithfulness to us and your love. And Lord, as we pause at the beginning of this time together today, you know the hurts, you know the, the feelings that are deep within the heart of each man, woman, boy, and girl today. And we bring them each to you, Father. We're glad to know that we don't have to do anything special other than just to call on your name and you will hear us when we pray. And so for that person today that is struggling physically, we ask that you would heal their bodies according to your plan and your purpose. We pray for that person who is going through some emotional stress and trauma at this time, that you would be their great counselor, their comforter, their strength today. That person today, Father, who may be sorrowing, there's been many people who have died not only in our state, but across the nation and across the world. And no doubt there's somebody that is watching this today that either, that either they themselves or someone they know is suffering because of a loved one who has passed away. And we ask today, Father, that you would comfort them. We know there's lots of questions. We know, Lord, there's a lot of concerns that we have in our hearts and all of our questions will not be answered. But Father, we trust them with you and we leave them with you. We pray your perfect will to be done and accomplished. And Father, we pray for our nation today. Again, we pray for our president. We ask, Lord, that you would bless him and the team, the staff that he has gathered around him. We ask that you would give them the guidance, the direction, the wisdom that they need today to know just exactly how to direct and to lead us as a nation. Bless our governor today. He needs you, Father, and we pray that you would speak to him. Talk to his soul, Lord, most of all. Help him to look to Jesus, that he would know you as his personal Savior and friend. Guide his thoughts. Guide his directions. Lord, I pray that you would lead he and all of those that are around him today. As they guide the state, that you would give them direction. Give them the help they need. Father, we all today, regardless of our age, regardless of our uh, standing and regardless of our position in society, we all need you. And so we ask that this day that you would give of your blessing, your presence into each and every one of our lives. We love you today, Father, and we just surrender and commit all of this to you. And we ask for your will to be done. It's in Jesus name we pray it all. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we welcome you. Again, as I said earlier, welcome to this worship service, worshiping our resurrected Savior. And we want to look to God's word now today. And I want to direct your attention to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 16. I want to read the account that Mark pens for us of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Mark chapter 16. Uh, normally, I would ask if you found it to say amen. Go ahead. Have you found it? Okay, if you didn't find it, say, wait on me. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I guess everybody found it. So we'll go ahead and start reading. And we're going to begin at verse number two of Mark chapter 16. 
Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. <clears throat> I read from the 16th chapter of Mark, the story of the resurrection. And much of this morning's, uh, today's message, I want to go to the 15th chapter of, of Mark. So turn back one page in your, in your Bible. We'll spend most of our time there today in the message. But I, I read about a teacher teaching Sunday school in uh, this particular case. It happened to be a woman. And the, the lady teacher told her students, said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want to give you a little homework between now and next Sunday. I want you to read Isaiah chapter number nine. Read Isaiah chapter nine. I encourage you to read it every day because I'm going to ask you a question or two. And I want to see if you've read it and see what you what uh, it is that's stuck in your mind from reading Isaiah chapter 9. So the, all of the Sunday school children all went home and, and the next Sunday they came back just uh, like they had, uh, had anticipated. And the teacher said, tell me, how many of you read the ninth chapter of Isaiah? Boy, they all raised their hand. I did, teacher, I read it. I read it every day. Mom made sure I read it every day. I read it every day of the week. Well, she said, that's wonderful, guys. I'm so proud of you. Good job. Thank you so very much. And I tell you what, I've got a piece of candy here that I'll give to each one of you if you can finish this verse. One of the verses in Isaiah chapter 9, I want you to finish it for me. The beginning of that verse goes like this. The people who walk in darkness... The people who walk in darkness. Can any of you finish that verse for me? And the, the children again raise their hand and begin to scream wildly and without any kind of order. They hadn't quite figured that out yet. They're supposed to wait for them to be called on. And they begin to answer with, with answers kind of like this. The people who sat in darkness <clears throat> use less electricity. <laughs> the people who sat in or who walk in darkness, they stub their toes a lot. People who walk in darkness spend most of their time sleeping. People who walk in darkness are usually burglars. And I like this one. The people who walk in darkness could sure enough use a flashlight. <clears throat> Those answers obviously weren't the right answer, but I ask you, can you tell me what is the rest of the verse? The people who walk in darkness... I'll go ahead and finish it for you. We'll see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. The prophet Isaiah was talking about Jesus. He was prophesying how he was going to be the light of the world. Now the calendar tells us that today is supposed to be Easter Sunday. We should be celebrating together. We should be in a, in a group. We should be all in here this morning wearing our new outfit and sporting a new do and, and just uh, having a great time of celebrating together. In a little bit, we would gather together with family and we would have, have, have uh, had a good time of fellowship and eating our ham and mashed potatoes and noodles and all of that sweet potato casserole and homemade sweet rolls and all that other good stuff. I need to quit talking like that. It's going to be lunchtime here in a little bit. But today, this Easter Sunday, it's a little different than we've ever experienced. But in reality, you know, we worship our resurrected Savior every Sunday. That's the reason why worship was changed from Saturday to Sunday, because it was a day that they commemorated. They worship the resurrected Savior. It's the day that Jesus rose again from the day from the dead. And the early church established Sunday as the day of worship 
the resurrected Jesus Christ. But there was something that was very special that happened at the cross on this particular day that Jesus was crucified. And I believe that it most likely changed the life of this person forever. This one man that I'm referring to today is the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion, it was something that he saw. It was something that he experienced, something that he heard on that day that caused his life to be changed forever, forever. Giving just a little bit of background to this, we know that whenever the Roman government would take over a, a section of land or a country, a nation, they would dispatch at least 5,000. They would call, they called them a legion, a legion. And the legion was 5,000. They would dispatch 5,000 soldiers to keep the peace, to keep there from being a, a, an, an insurrection, to keep the people from revolting and taking back their freedom from the Roman government. And in that group of 5,000, they were broke down into groups of 100. So, hence the name centurion. That The centurion is the person who was the leader of that group of 100 men. We don't know for sure, but some believe that the centurion that we're going to talk about here in Mark chapter 14 is the same centurion that came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8. You may remember that story. The centurion came to Jesus and told him about a servant that he had back home that was about to die. He was very, very sick and was about to die. And he loved his servant. He didn't want to see him die. And uh, he said, just say the word. And, and uh, I, you don't have to come home with, just say the word. My servant will be healed. And it's that same centurion that Jesus marveled at his faith. I tell you what, I want that kind of faith. I want that kind of faith that causes Jesus to marvel. And Jesus' response to this marvelous faith of this centurion was this, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And his servant, they found that his servant was healed at that very moment. Regardless if that's the same centurion or not, we know this for certain that this centurion here at the cross of Jesus Christ had a life altering and changing event to take place. And here's the question I have for you today. What caused this man to say, this truly is the son of God? And I ask you this, this in this uh, message as well, have you made that same proclamation? He is the son of God. I wanna notice a couple of things couple of reasons that might have been why it was that this man said, truly this was the Son of God. First of all, I would submit to your thinking that never a man had suffered the way that Jesus suffered and yet responded the way that Jesus responded. This was supposed to be just a regular day of crucifying another criminal for these soldiers, but we know that it would turn out to be anything but another ordinary day. These guys were trained to do this. They did it really on a regular basis, nearly a daily basis, and sometimes multiple times in the same day, they would crucify people. They had gotten so accustomed to doing it that they very seldom even showed any kind of emotion whatsoever. Plus, they almost looked for an opportunity to crucify a Jew. They hated the Jews. They saw them as rivals and they looked for opportunities to, to maybe to crucify another one of them. And here was their chance. They had heard early in the morning about the fact that there were a couple of individuals that were on the slate to be crucified that day. They were thieves, but they weren't exactly sure who it was that the third person was. They knew that, that in the temple and, and in the court, court system that there'd been a, somewhat of a political tug of war going on between Pilate and the, and the high priest and the Sadducees and, and uh, the scribes and the council and the, and the, the uh, scribes among them. But th they, they knew that this, this uh, tug of war was going on and at the center of it was this one fellow, but in all the accusations, they, this guy wouldn't answer. He wouldn't stand up and defend himself. And nobody else would either. The fact is, all the people they said were his followers had taken off and left them, forsook him and fled. But they finally 
get the opportunity as the judgment is passed down and we know the third individual to be Jesus. And he's taken out and he's given to the centurion, turned over to the centurion who turns him over to, his, to the soldiers to treat him as, the, as they wished. They took Jesus and they stripped him of his garments. They tied him to a whipping post and got a cat of nine tails and began to whip Jesus and whip him and whip him and whip him. When one soldier got tired of whipping, he gave the, the, uh, the whip to another soldier and he would whip him a while. And they just whipped and whipped and whipped Jesus. But in all of the suffering and all of the anguish, Jesus didn't suffer the way that most did. Most men that went through that kind of anguish and that kind of suffering would curse and would, would sw swear and would call out and would uh, try and get away and just all kinds of things. I can only imagine what they must have encountered and gone through. But Jesus took the sorrow. Jesus took the pain. Jesus took the beatings for you and for me. They would... They would take Jesus and he's just hardly got enough strength left to stand on his feet and they bring in a large wooden cross and lay it on his shoulder, across his shoulders and Jesus goes out the courtyard and out away from the, the place where he was beaten and down the street and he stumbles as he goes and he, the crowd begins to gather and to formulate and to follow Jesus and and the centurion and the soldiers as they head up the trail up to Calvary's mountain to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Jesus in his weakened physical condition couldn't, couldn't carry the cross and walk as well and he kept stumbling and falling and finally they grabbed a fellow out of the crowd. We know him as Simon, the Cyrene and Simon came and they made him carry Jesus' cross and he carried it to the top and laid it down. Then they put Jesus on the cross and drove the nails through his hands and through his feet. And they lifted him up and hung him there, suspended him between heaven and earth. And what little blood he had was continuing to trickle out of the wounds that were gaping on his flesh. Jesus sorrowed and suffered and he suffered the way no one ever suffered. We read in Mark chapter 14 that in all of his, all of the trial and the accusations that Jesus kept silent and didn't answer a word. As a result of that in chapter 15, we find that Pilate is amazed because Jesus didn't respond. And through it all, Jesus did not respond. In fact, as the prophet Isaiah said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb, like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is dumb. He did not open his mouth. What do you suppose though was going through the centurion's mind? He was no doubt standing over in the corner watching as all of this is taking place. And after all of this, they take him to the mountain and they hang him on a cross. And as Jesus is sorrowing, Jesus is suffering, it's just excruciating pain. It's hard to grasp and to imagine. We know what it's like when we stub our toe from walking in darkness. We know what it's like whenever we get a hangnail. We know what it's like when we have a toothache. We make the rest of the world miserable. Jesus didn't suffer the way you and I did. He suffered. And in his suffering, what did he do? He prayed. He didn't pray that the Father would remove him from this situation. He didn't pray that God would instantly heal his body. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world. He could have called 10,000 angels to take him off of the cross and set him free, but he didn't. Instead, we find Jesus praying for his tormentors. I don't know whether you caught it or not. I would encourage you to to read the gospel account of the resurrection and the, the crucifixion of Jesus. When you read Luke chapter 22, you'll find the words of Jesus like this. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
Now, if you and I were praying, we would have said, Father, I pray that you would send down fire from heaven and knock him on the head. Knock this fellow out. Lord Jesus, Father in heaven, would you please come to my rescue and lay the fleas of a thousand camels and fest his armpits. That's the kind of prayer you would have prayed and I would have prayed the same thing. But Jesus didn't pray that kind of prayer of retribution. He, play, he prayed the prayer that God the Father would forgive them for they didn't understand what it was that they were doing. You see, Jesus suffered severely, and yet he prayed for his tormentors. Let's go on. I think another thing that caused this centurion to say never, this truly was the Son of God, was the fact that he saw Jesus die like no one had ever died. Now you know that just a moment ago, I told you about how that he was hanging on the cross and praying for the forgiveness of, of his tormentors. But I also noticed that on, in this whole deal, Jesus said, he's already prayed for himself. In the garden, he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he had resigned to doing the Father's will, and he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done, O Father. So he had already resigned himself to doing the Father's will, so the only thing left for him to do was to remember others. And we find Jesus doing just exactly that. We notice that Jesus is concerned about the crowd. In Luke 23, in verses 27 and 28, we would find this there, this written for us there. Following him was a large crowd of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting Jesus. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. You see, Jesus was concerned for the crowd that was around about him. He knew what was coming just in a few short days, in a few short years, the, the captivity and the sorrow and the, the uh, slavery that they would encounter and endure. Jesus knew what, it was, what was gonna happen, what was gonna take place. And so he's concerned about the crowd. But also I notice that he's concerned about the thief. As they're hanging on the cross, those other two guys I was talking about earlier, Hung on, hung on one on his right hand and one on his left hand and, and they're, they're hanging there and they're, they join in. The one particular fellow, he joins in with the rest of the crowd making fun of Jesus and mocking him and, and uh, telling him, says, get, get down off of this cross and then save us as well if you're truly the son of God. Come on. Well, the other fellow looked at him and said, man, what in the world is wrong with you? Don't you realize this man in the middle, he is... He has been crucified not for doing anything wrong. He has been crucified for doing what is right. You and I are soft suffering. You and I have been crucified for doing wrong. We deserve our punishment. He doesn't deserve it. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, would you please remember me when you come in your kingdom? Jesus could have responded a lot of different ways, but he responded with forgiveness and he says today very truly I tell you today you shall be with me in paradise what was it Jesus was concerned about the thief Jesus was concerned about the crowd I also noticed that Jesus was concerned about his mother you remember that uh, Jesus had, had gone back to his hometown and they made fun of him and ran him out of town he had been forsaken by his family. And yet Jesus still took time as he's hanging on the cross, just about to die. And he looks down and he sees his mother and somewhere over a few feet away, no doubt keeping proper social distancing, he sees John. And he says to his mother, mother, woman, behold your son. And to his, the son, to the disciple, who is John, he says, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her, took Jesus, his mother, Mary, into his home to take care of her. You see, never a man had ever suffered like this man. Never a man had died like this man, taking care of the crowd. Everybody else that died on the cross died cursing died in awful pain and anguish. And Jesus was in pain and anguish, but he didn't die in retribution. 
He didn't die looking for an opportunity to get even vocally with those who were tormented him and who had hung him on a cross. He died like no man had ever died. And the lastly today, I want us to notice that Jesus, something else about Jesus that caused this man to proclaim him as the son of God is the fact that never a man ever rose again from the dead like Jesus rose again from the dead. Everybody else, those soldiers had watched die. They had watched as, as they took the bodies off of the cross and gave them to the family members. And they had seen them as they wept and sorrowed and, and mourned the passing of their loved one. They had experienced it over and over again until they were just callous to the fact. And I have a feeling that they almost were dumbfounded. Here is Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and asks for his body. He didn't want him hanging on the cross on the Sabbath day. And so he goes and he asks for the body and Pilate gives him the body and Joseph Arimathea lowers the body and takes Jesus and prepares it, takes it to his own grave and buries him there, there in his own tomb. There was a large stone that they rolled across in front of the, in front of the tomb so that it would keep anybody from stealing the body of Jesus. They wanted to ensure that Jesus would not come out of the grave or that his disciples would not come and steal the body away and say that, that he had risen just like he said and try and claim victory over the grave. And so he said, I tell you, Pilate, would you please set the seal of the Roman government on that tomb and on that gravestone. Seal it and place a couple of guards alongside of it. Protect it. Don't let anybody get near it. It's exactly what happened. However, early in the morning, there was a tremendous earthquake that took place. Was it coincidence? Absolutely not. It was an earthquake that took place and the ground split open. We find that the angel of the Lord came down and he rolled that stone away from the mouth of the tomb and Jesus Christ came out of that grave victorious and alive forevermore. He did not die like other men died. Other men died and stayed dead. Jesus died and was as dead as anybody has ever been dead. But on the third day, he came alive, victorious out of the grave. And this afternoon, this morning, he is alive and he is well. And you ask me how I know he's alive because he lives within my heart and he lives today to make intercession for you and for me before the everlasting father in heaven today. The soldiers, they had crucified him and they tried to guard his tomb and keep the, the, the uh, disciples away from him, but they couldn't keep Jesus sealed in the tomb. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. And Jesus Christ is alive forevermore today. That angel, as he rolled the stone away, sits down on it, uses a lounge chair. The, the uh, soldiers that are there, they are, they are so struck with, the, with what happened that, that for fear, the scripture tells us, the guards shook for fear and they fell down and became like dead men themselves. They flat out passed out. I don't know how much of, the, how much of all of the, the resurrection they remember or how much they uh, could recollect. How much of it they actually witnessed being how they passed out. But when they came to, they realized what had happened. They saw the, the stone laying there and, and the angel sitting on it. They looked and saw that the tomb was empty. They saw grave clothes, but no body. And they took off and headed for the hills. They ran out of there like a scared jackrabbit. I can guarantee you I probably would have done the same thing. Even though they were accustomed to, to death, though they were accustomed to all of this, they never expected Jesus to come out of that tomb on that day. The tomb, the angel rolled away the stone, not to let Jesus out, but in order to let it us, you and me, to allow us in so that we could see that Jesus Christ is alive today, that his body is not there. He is not there. The grave clothes remained there, but Jesus came out of the tomb alive. 
He is risen, just like he said. Did you catch it there? That was what the angel told those that came, those ladies who came to the tomb, said, he is not here, he is risen. Go tell his disciples. You can see the place where they had laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that, they will, that he's going before you into Galilee. And that I tell you, you will see him. He is risen just as he told you. It was the cross, at the cross that the centurion met Jesus Christ and it changed his life. Never a man lived and suffered and died like this man. It was at the cross that the centurion said, this surely was the Son of God. Surely it was the Son of God. And it's on this Easter 2020 that you and I can meet the resurrected Savior at the empty tomb today. He is alive to make intercession for you at this very moment. If you'll call out to him and say, behold, he is the son of God and confess your sins and repent today. He'll come into your life and he can change your life forever and ever and ever. If you do not know the resurrected Lord today, let me tell you, you can know him as your personal savior. You can seek him. I encourage you today. I encourage you to call out to him. Repent of your sins and ask Jesus into your heart and into your life. Why don't you do that this morning as I pray to get, as we pray together. Father, we're so glad today that you are alive and that you hear us when we pray. We're not praying to some stone or wooden or metal idol, but we're, we're praying to a Jesus Christ who is alive. We're praying to one who hears us when we pray. Though we don't know exactly how to pray as we ought to at times, we're glad that you make intercession for us and you care for us and you love us. And Father, I pray for that individual today who does not know you as their personal savior that you would help them to confess and repent of their sins and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I have sinned. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. I believe that thou art the son of the living God. Father, I pray that you would bless today, not only today on this Easter Sunday, but may this day be a watershed day in the life of somebody because they met the resurrected Savior at an empty tomb. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you from the very depths of our heart that you love us and that you care for us. And though the tomb is empty, salvation is full. For whosoever will believe can be made whole. And we love you, Father. We thank you that you are alive and we thank you that you are in the world today and that, Lord, one day you're coming again to receive us unto yourself, that where you are, there we may be also. We ask, Lord, that you would bless your people. Keep us safe. Lord, I pray for health and strength, not just physically, but health and strength spiritually, that we would be drawn closer to you. And may we more accurately reflect the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And we'll give you praise and glory, for we ask it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. I would encourage you on Wednesdays to join in together at seven o'clock in the evening as we have Bible study together, just a short little devotional, five, 10, 15 minutes, not very long. I'd encourage you and stay in the word. Keep praying. You get discouraged. Let me tell you, there's no better place to turn than to God's word. Go to him in prayer. Trust in him. He'll be your all in all. God bless you.